Good morning. Our first reading this morning is from the fourth chapter of Ephesians, verses 25 to 32, <coughs> excuse me, beginning on page 1135 in the Red Pew Bible. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing <clears throat> must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. This is the word of our Lord. Amen. Thanks. This morning's second scripture reading also in the New Testament from the Gospel of Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 8 through 12. And if you're using a red church Bible, it's on page 10. 1,009. I mean, the word is holy, but there aren't 10,000 pages yet. Again, the 12th chapter of Luke, verses 8 through 12. And Jesus said, I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. May the Lord add his blessing. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, speak to our hearts through the word of God and what you've laid upon my heart this hour, this day, and I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So folks, uh, this morning I want to speak to you uh, about speaking truth. And so somebody sent me an image I want to have, Keith's going to put up on the screen this morning. That's why I turned out the overhead light. Maybe you can see it a little bit better. And um, you know, we live in a culture today where it's not popular to say the right things and to speak truth. And so this is, a, this is a staying safe COVID image that somebody sent me. And it contrasts some safe and unsafe practices. Uh, now, it, it's probably fair to say that this falls into the PC category, right? The politically correct category. And as I'm going to walk you through this list. Now, now there is some satire here, but there's also some truth, right? So it's unsafe to worship in a small church, right? Even in a large church. Uh, but it's okay to riot in massive crowds, right? And so in small churches, you're supposed to wear a mask, or in large churches, you're supposed to wear a mask. But when you're rioting, it, it doesn't matter. You can just, you, you can wear, you know, um, armor and a vest, but you don't have to wear a mask, right? Um, you can't hug grandma. She has to stay behind closed doors, right? But you can scream at grandma who went to a Trump rally. 
uh, a sporting event, right? It's unsafe at a sporting event, but when the athletes are protesting, that's safe. It's okay when they're taking a knee, right? You can't shop at small businesses, but it's okay to loot businesses, right? Uh, in fact, it's not looting now. They're just taking what they are supposed to rightfully get and deserve. Um, licking doorknobs um, is unsafe. Uh, licking doorknobs to protest systemic racism or something like that, that's okay. Uh, walking through a restaurant without a mask is not allowed. That's unsafe. Uh, but if you sit at the same table in that same restaurant, or if you sit at the table in that same restaurant, it's okay not to wear a mask. Uh, I don't know, folks, but um, I mean, I don't consider myself to be a man of great intelligence. But when I look at this, I think I'm pretty intelligent. This doesn't make any sense, right? Um, here you go. Uh, this one is for Nancy Pelosi. Getting your hair done if you're a peasant, if you're a filthy peasant, I want to emphasize filthy, right? That's unsafe. But if you're Nancy Pelosi, it's okay to get your hair done, right? Uh, it's wrong to hang out on the Florida beach alone, but if you're locked up in a New York nursing home, uh, that's safe. By the way, the New York nursing homes had the highest death rates in the country. That's why that's on this list here. You can't go to a funeral, but it's okay to go to the cemetery to harvest mail-in votes. Uh, there were some uh, shenanigans uh, uh, at uh, a cemetery with mail-in votes. That's why that's on there. Going outside and enjoying life. No, you folks can't do that. Uh, but staying inside and slipping into deep depression, that's okay. Just see your doctor. He'll write you some pills, get you a prescription for some pills. Taking hydroxychloroquine. Uh, that's not unsafe, although it's been proven to be safe. Uh, and yet, it's safe to let Bill Gates inject you with the mark of the beast. I'm only kidding. That's, that's satire, right? But uh, they want to inject everybody. That's what they want to do. Um, that ain't happening with me. Uh, going to a polling place to vote for Trump is unsafe, but if you're going to go to a polling place to vote for Biden, that, of course, that's perfectly safe. Now, look, again, um, there is some PC here. There's political correctness here. And um, there's also some satire and some truth. And I put that up this morning because I want to talk to you about speaking truth. Speaking truth is a very, very relevant topic today. Uh, we're living in a time where our institutions are under attack. The police are under attack. Political conservatism is under attack. Your First Amendment rights, constitutional rights, are under attack. Christianity is under attack, the church is under attack, the testimony of scripture is under attack, morality is under attack. When I say morality, I'm talking about traditional and biblical morality. The church is under attack. Everything, virtually everything that we know and have held near and dear in growing up in this country in terms of Christian and constitutional hallmarks of our country, they have been under attack. That's why speaking the truth in this time is relevant. Uh, I've said this before. Uh, this is true to Isaiah 5, verse 20. We're living in a time where they call evil good and good evil. And we need to recognize that speaking the truth is very, very relevant these days. And you know, this, this past week I've been reflecting on how far our country has fallen. Now, some of you folks are older than I am, but uh, I go back, this isn't the country that I recognized growing up. It's just not. Um, I was uh, reflecting, wh where did this start? Now, some say what, uh, would say that it started with uh, political correct correctness. Uh, but um, I think it started with religion, going after religion. I think it started before they went after the, the political aspect of things. They went after the religious aspect of things with the First Amendment. That's where it started. I remember after accepting the Lord in the early 80s, in fact, uh, you'd probably trace it back to even sometimes in the 70s, but they, 
Uh, and you could probably even go back into the 1930s with the Scopes trials where they discredited the Bible. And they started to go after the churches. For the last 50, 60, 70, 80 years, they've been getting, going after religion. And so when they, and why do I mention that? Because when you think of the First Amendment, you usually think of free speech, right? But it's also your right to worship, your right to freedom of religion. You know, it's not consigned to freedom of speech, it's freedom of religion. You see, so if you go after that, then that one domino is going to make another domino fall. So they went after the religious aspect of it, of the First Amendment, and now they're going after the political aspect. You can't say anything. You can't say anything. And, and I point this out because I, I, I want, I want, and this is very, very relevant for our time. And I want you to think about this. This is what Marxism and socialism and communism does. That's the agenda. You go after the religion, then you go after the political angle of it. Because they are systems that promote statism. In other words, the state is God. God's not God, the state is God. And so that's why they go after religion to make that domino fall and then the political domino, they go after that to silence everybody. So they have to go after free speech now because they've gone after religion for the last 50, 60, 70, 80 years. And so is it any wonder that our country is where it's at? Is it any wonder that they're going after free speech? You know, we, we've been studying the book of Revelation this, these past number of months. I'm telling you folks, I can see it as clearly as you folks are sitting here and I see you clearly. I don't have cataracts. I don't have blurred vision. I can see it clearly with what's coming. The, the battle appears to be political on the surface, but the underlying aspect of it, it's spiritual through and through. Jesus said, that believers, that is you and me, the church, and I emphasize the church, we're not of this world. They have to go after us. They have to go after it. What you stand for stands in the way of the world system that is being promoted. If you stand for Christ, if you love Christ, if you know Christ, if you embrace his word, you're in the way. Uh, scripture goes against everything of this world system that's being promoted. Sharing anything political that is in conflict with this world system, it's got to be taken down. Any politician standing in the way of this system has to be taken down. Any pastor will be taken down. Any business person will be taken down. Christ is in conflict with the system. He has to be removed, including the Bible. I believe that Revelation indicates there's a time where a Bible will be hard to find. I mean, why is it that people would take the mark of the beast? Because maybe they can't read about it in a Bible. Remember the other month when they were going after political statues, I stood up here and I told you the religious statues were next. Was I prophetic? Was I right? You know I was. Of course, I'd love to be right. Everybody else does too. Our testimony for Christ and the Word of God is antithetical to this world system. Recall in Revelation chapter 1, John was exiled in Patmos, on the Isle of Patmos for the testimony of Christ in the Word of God. And that was at the, just like around 95 AD. I mean, just 20, 30 years after the, some of the apostles were put to death. Folks, this system is not coming. It's here. It's here right now. And we need to wake up to the reality, and it's been here for some time. 
They just, they've taken their masks off. They want you to wear a mask, but they've taken their masks off with this. The movement's out in the open. They're just getting more aggressive, that's all. So what, this is why speaking the truth is a relevant message for our time. Because the church can be a powerful dynamic and force socially. When you share Christ, you don't know what God does with it. But we're, we're called to share the Holy Scriptures. We're, share, we're called to sh share and lift up Christ. And we're called to do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as the church, we must stand up. We must speak. We mustn't keep quiet. Now, I, I can tell you that some people don't like this kind of message. I got that. I wish I didn't have to do this kind of message. I wish that everything was socially and politically okay with our society and our country. But it's not. And if we don't speak up, everyone's in trouble. You know, uh, you've, you probably have heard this quote. It's worthy to mention again. Martin Niemöller was a German theologian and Lutheran pastor. And he was best known for his opposition to the Nazi regime. And he wrote this, and again, it's, it's worth repeating. You've heard it, I'm sure. First they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the socialists or the communists. There's different versions of that. And I did not speak out because I was not a communist or a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for me, and there's no one left to speak out for me. And, and that's essentially what it is. I mean, you have to speak out because there's going to be no one left to speak out. If you don't conform to everything that they want to funnel into a very, very narrow, particular worldview, you're in trouble. And that's why I'm doing it now. You know, you say something on social media, you're taken down, right Keith? Keith is banned from Facebook constantly because he says the wrong thing. And yet he's only sharing scripture in Christ. You know, you see it with uh, our current president. If they don't like what he tweets, they take it down. This is what's happening. We need to speak the truth. We need to speak out. We need to speak up. We need to stand up. We need to be counted. Now, I want to talk to you about speaking truth, but I want to make a distinction about speaking truth in the power of the Holy Spirit and just speaking truth or speaking your truth. Uh, speaking truth in the power of the Holy Spirit is what I want to talk about today, but I want you to be aware that there is a movement called speaking truth to power, okay? And that movement drops off the words in the power of the Holy Spirit, all right? And this was a, a, a phrase that was coined by the Quakers in the 50s, and it was a call for the United States to stand against fascism and other forms of totalitarianism. So the movement is called Speaking Truth to Power. I want to talk to you about speaking truth in the power of the Holy Spirit, but speaking truth to power is to, is to basically stand up against fascism and totalitarianism. Now, it was, a, it was coined by the Quakers, and just as an aside, the Quakers departed from the scriptures a long time ago. You, it's important for you to understand that. All right? If you research a little bit of church history, the Quakers threw out the scriptures because they didn't like doctrinal statements. And so they threw out the scriptures, and they have no scriptures in their meeting places these days. All right? So, speaking truth to power identifies himself as a movement that speaks to oppressive governments. And supposedly it's a movement for social justice. Now, I want to go on record to say that there's nothing wrong with seeking social justice and working toward a just society. Because everyone benefits from that when that happens. If you read the Old Testament prophets, much of their messages were about social justice. 
you know, the rich oppressing the poor and how that shouldn't be done, and usury rates and, ex and extortionism and doing things where one person or one group was harmed by another, and they sought a just society. So I'm for social justice, but justice that is socially just for all, just not for certain people or certain select groups. And if you take a look at this social justice movement today, there's plenty wrong with it. Typically, it's a far-left agenda that's under the banner of social justice. Uh, we talked about this last month, about the Black Lives Matter organization. They're a far-left, you know, homosexual-promoting justice movement. That's nothing Christian about it, nothing socially just about it at all. It's to promote a certain agenda under the banner of social justice, and yet it's far left. And what these organizations want to do from top to bottom, they want to change our society and the way you live. That's what they want to do politically, socially, morally, economically. That's what they do. You know, I, I was thinking about this. All of the Old Testament prophets would never put their names to the Black Lives Matter movement, that organization, and all these far-left social justice organizations. They wouldn't do it because it's so antithetical to the scriptures and Christianity and God and the Bible. It's amazing. But you know what we do? We, we take everything and we, and we swallow it hook, line, and sinker. That's what we do. The Speaking uh, Truth to Power movement singles out the political right, conservatives, and it labels them as fascists. And I kind of find that to be somewhat comical and ironic. Because the far left, they, they see the speck in the far right side, but they can't see the beam in their own. You talk about fascists. What's happening in Portland, Chicago, Rochester, New York, and all these other places, that's fascism. Just burn it down. That's what they do, burn it down. I, 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 I don't, I feel like, I said to somebody the other week, I feel like I'm living in the twilight zone. It's insane. This is America. Did you ever think you'd see anything like it? There's also another term that you should be familiar with. It's, it's called how to speak your truth. That's also becoming a movement, right? Now, I want to distinguish and differentiate and disassociate uh, from those groups. How to speak your truth uh, should be a red flag to each and every one of us. And here's the problem. Your truth may conflict with my truth and his truth and her truth and their truth. And that's the problem, you see? So who defines truth? I guarantee you if we get to the point where that movement gets traction, I guarantee you we're going to raise the question, it will lead to the infamous question that Pontius Pilate posed to Jesus. You know what that was? What is truth? That's where it's going to go. Your truth, her truth, his truth, my truth. What is truth? Now, uh, I have to tell you, I, I have read this book and I could never find any phrase that talks about speak your truth. If you find it, I'll give you, I'll give you a thousand dollars. Find it for me. Scripture never talks about your truth. It talks about God's truth. It's about God's truth. Uh, Proverbs 12 verse 17, he who speaks truth tells what is right but a false witness is full of deceit. Uh, there's a lot of deceit being spoken of these days. Psalm 15 too, he who walks with integrity and works righteousness, they generally speak truth in their heart. You don't have integrity, you don't walk in righteousness, you speak deceit. Proverbs 8 verse 7, for my mouth will utter truth and wickedness and is abomination to my lips. And that's what I want to utter today is truth. Job 33 verse 3, my words 
are from the uprightness of my heart and my lips speak knowledge sincerely. And get this. The Apostle Paul shares the gospel with the Galatians. I think you know they started to depart from the gospel. And he writes the book of Galatians. And he says to them in chapter 4 verse 16. So I have become your enemy by telling you the truth. <laughs> you know you tell the truth today and you're an enemy. That's where we're at. It's sad. Take a look at Luke chapter 12 verse 11. Luke chapter 12 verse 11. And Jesus said, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how or what you should speak in your defense or what you should say. Don't be anxious. Don't be concerned about the how or the what. God will give it to you. Amen. You know, I ask you, how many people today are afraid to say anything? Anything political? Anything religious? Anything social? Anything about scripture? Anything about Christ? How many of you here today are concerned about what you say and how you say it to people? Yeah, I see some raising their hands, right? That is the stated goal. To silence, to stifle debate and free speech, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. That's the goal. To get you anxious, to get you fearful, to keep you shut up, so you don't say anything and offend anybody. It, it, it's, it's sad. Uh, Bill uh, expressed condolences to me this morning because the Flyers got knocked out of Game 7 last night. It was atrocious. Uh, they lost 4 to nothing. Um, I didn't even watch the third period. I couldn't bring myself to do it. But then, of course, you Bruins fans um, are in mourning as well because, you know, the Bruins went out last week. But there's this commentator, Mike Milbury, now, Mike Milbury used to be a player for the Bruins, and he was a coach at one time, and now he's an NHL commentator. And so, uh, if you don't follow hockey, let me just tell you, they're, they're, playing, they're playing hockey in a bubble. Um, all the East Conference teams are playing in Toronto, and all the Western Conference teams are playing in Edmonton, Alberta. And so the teams don't travel. But here's the thing, the bubble is, um, no people are allowed in the stadium, right? The, the, it's, it's just, they're playing a hockey game with no fans there, right? And they pipe in all the music and all the sound and all the things that would go to the game, right? So, listen to this. This guy, Brian Boucher, who's another commentator, says about playing in the bubble. He says, quote, if you think about it, it's a terrific environment with regard to, well, if you enjoy playing and being with your teammates for long periods of time, it's a perfect place. That, that is to focus and to really be about hockey, right? Milbury says, not even any women here to disrupt your, com your, your con concentration. That's what Milbury said. About the players being distracted because women might be there. Now, um, the last thing I checked, you know, um, guys are usually attracted to women and women are usually attracted to... I mean, that's, isn't that the way God kind of made it, right? So Milbury was suspended from NBC because... He, wasn't, he was being misogynist and politically correct. But I will tell you, if he said that there were no women and no men there for the players to get distracted, then he wouldn't have been silenced, you see? Because then he would have pandered to the gay community. If he added men, he would have been safe. He would have slid in at home base safe, you see? Talk about cancel culture. It's insane. People are being shamed into political correctness and silence. So, where does that put our church in society? Where does it put the church in society? Where does it put the scriptures in society? 
Jane Campbell sent me an article uh, about three, four weeks ago, maybe four, maybe even five. Great, great article. It was written by a guy. I'm going to see Jane. Uh, I'm going to see if I can send this out to the church family. I sent it to some of the elders. Uh, written by Abu Murray, uh, uh, Abdu Murray, uh, a Muslim turned Christian. Uh, the article is canceled. How Eastern honor shame mentality traveled west. And basically the cancel culture that we see in America is, is as an Eastern culture. It promotes an honor shame paradigm. And if you don't conform to the system, then you're silenced and you're shamed and you're put off, you see? You see it actually in the scriptures where, you know, if you converted to Christianity, you were thrown out of the synagogue. It's the same idea, uh, except on a larger scale. And, and so, if you don't conform, you're shamed. And you're boxed out and you're isolated out. Uh, we were reading articles uh, with the, um, in studying Revelation about how they're going to bring this, probably bring this economic prowess uh, together where ultimately you won't be able to buy or sell unless you sign on the stated dotted line uh, that you embrace that world system. Now think about that. Think about going home tonight and trying to figure out where you get your next meal because you're not in the system. Listen to what he says. This is a profound quote. Um, Abdu Murray says, But Jesus transformed his shame-ridden identity into one characterized by honor. He replaced the temporary social honor bestowed by hypocrites with the transcendent honor bestowed only by God. You're dealing with a bunch of hypocrites that want to silence everybody else. And yet they can do whatever they want. So, as the church, what do we do in this cancel culture? We're in the midst of this free-for-all. Where do we stand? What do we say? Because as I read my scriptures here, we're supposed to confess Christ, right? We're supposed to share Jesus. So how do we do it? Is there a spiritual recipe? Now, I use the word recipe here. Maybe, the, maybe the, that's not the right word. You know, um, ladies, when you get a recipe, right, from somebody else, what, is it, what does it have? It has a list of things you put in the dish you're going to make, right? And it might tell you the do's. It might actually share some don'ts, depending on how complex the recipe is, right? When you think of recipe here, spiritual recipe, don't think of a list of do's and don'ts. It's much different. The spiritual recipe is simply trusting in the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit to give you that right word in that moment. That's what it is. Be prepared. I, I have notes here this morning. If you were to check my notes and check the message... There's a lot of things I said this morning that aren't in my notes. And trusting God for it. But you trust that he'll give you the right words and the right thoughts and what to say and how to say it and when to say it and to whom to say it and when not to say it or how much to say. Uh, we don't have time. It would maybe be a great study sometime. Go to John chapter 18 and 19. You'll see the recipe that Jesus used before Pilate and the Sanhedrin. You go over to Acts chapter 24 and 25 and 26. You see the Apostle Paul before Festus, the procurator Festus. You see him before uh, Felix. You see him before King Agrippa. And, you know, just tremendous stuff that was shared as they were led under the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, very quickly, you know what I did? I, I went back to John 18 and 19. And these are, some, these are some tidbits that I pulled out. Jesus spoke truth. He spoke openly. He spoke wisely. He spoke when God led him to, the Holy Spirit led him to. He even corrected Pilate when... Pilate was misunderstood. 
And remember Pilate says, you know, oh, I have the authority to release you or crucify you. Jesus corrected him. He says, no, you don't. He remained silent at times when appropriate. He always taught. When he opened his mouth, he always taught and spoke something teachable. And then he goes on to say, I, I, I spoke nothing in secret. He, he, he basically spoke it from the mountaintop. That's what he did. And then he even goes and he challenges those in authority to refute him publicly uh, for if he, if he said something wrong. He, he, they, they, one, of the, one, of the, one of the guys, the soldier, struck him. And he said, if I have spoken wrongly, bear witness of the wrong. But if, if rightly, why do you strike me? You know, God was just so plugged in to every time, every situation. And that's what we need to be. We need to be plugged in. Uh, Paul was passionate in his plea. He shared the truth of the gospel before magistrates. He stood boldly, openly, honestly, wisely, and he wasn't ashamed of the gospel. He wasn't ashamed to speak up. He wore Christ with a banner on his, on his lapel. And he took every opportunity. Didn't matter if he was canceled. Take a look at verse 12. Luke chapter 12. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour. It's going to come from God. If we're walking with God. I want to leave you with a final thought. The greatest thing that you and I can do or anyone can do, is to accept Christ as Savior. That's the greatest thing that you could ever do this side of heaven. And one of the other greatest things that you can do is to share Christ and the truth of the gospel. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my heavenly Father. That's the, one of the greatest things. You know, I was praying here this morning during one of the songs of the privilege of sharing the Word of God. And, and you know, I've said this before, you have pulpits too. In fact, your re collectively, your relationships out, way outnumber mine. Maybe even some of your relationships that you have from work and, you know, family and neighbors and extended family, you might have, be reaching more people than me. But you have a pulpit. And, 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 I, and I take a look at what's going on in this world and I see great opportunity for the church to speak against it. Great opportunity to speak out. You know, to stand up for God. To look for those opportunities and to seize them. You know, could it be off with your head? Perhaps. I mean, these, these messages now, they go up to social media, right? They're on Facebook, uh, Facebook, YouTube. I don't care. I'm speaking the truth. You know, I tell people, you know, maybe they put me out of my misery if I take a bullet. I don't care anymore. I'm done with it. I speak truth. Everything that you see, everything that you see is anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Christian, anti-Constitution, anti-conservatism. And they're coming for you. And, and that's not a conspiracy theory. I'm telling you now, prophetically, and I don't consider myself a prophet, but I'm telling you, when you take a look, they're coming for you. And tell me I'm wrong. I hope some of you will come and visit me in prison. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you and bless you uh, for the scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation. 
We bless you for the truth as it is in Jesus. And we thank you that we have that testimony of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And we thank you uh, for the word of God. And we thank you for the opportunities that you'll give us to speak out, to stand up, to be counted, to share uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to be about politics, but to be about truth and the truth as it is in Jesus. Uh, we thank you for this time. We bless you for it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.